does everyone have a chair? Because we do have a few extra ones around. Um, there's one up over here. And um, do we need two more chairs? Do we do mind giving, helping these people get some chairs? There's more in the next room, I think. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for being here and joining us for the Imaginings exhibition. Uh, my name is Saskia Still, and I am a doctoral student here at OISE. And I would like to, at this time, also acknowledge and introduce um, the co-curators of this exhibition, um, one of whom is Gail, who I think just wandered around the corner, if you want to wave Gail. Uh, there she is. <laughs> and the other curator of this exhibition today is Sharon Newmaster, who is the ESL consultant for um, Waterloo Region. Region District School Board. I was get the C sometimes mixed up. Um, anyway, we have had an absolutely wonderful time working together and um, conceptualizing this exhibition. Um, I'd also like to thank Paula Marcus and Jim Cummins, who, who's here as well, uh, for their support and encouragement for us to put this exhibition together. Part of why doing this work was so wonderful was the, the work of all of the teachers who have um, submitted their works to share with you here today. Um, their, the quality of the submissions was absolutely remarkable, and we had just as much fun planning the exhibit as talking about all of the great projects and the <laughs> ideas that they gave to us. Um, a couple housekeeping notes for you about the way the session is going to work. I'm going to say a couple comments um, to talk about the um, theoretical background that informed the um, exhibition itself and its conceptualization. Um, and then I'm going to introduce four panelists each of whom is going to come on up and share um, their work that they have brought um, to share with you today. We tried to select four people who were doing very different things. So you could get a real taste for um, <coughs> different types of projects and, and different experiences. And then following that, Jim is going to do a short, he's going to lead us off in a, a short question and answer period. And then for the remainder of the um, time that we have, which is half of the time, we will open it up to the people who are here for a gallery walk. All the um, submit, most of the exhibitors are here. There are just a couple who are presenting in other sessions and, and could not be here in person, but their, their works are pretty self-explanatory. Um, so I invite you to circulate, talk to um, all of these wonderful uh, teachers who have contributed their works here today, and we have some students that you can talk to as well. Um, and. Following that, after the session is over, the exhibit will be here until 3.15. So please tell um, colleagues who are also here today to come on up and have a look and uh, see what um, everyone here has done. Um, so I'm just gonna talk sh briefly about the context within which this exhibition was created. Um, as part of my, my work here as a doctoral student at OISE, I've been involved in, in Jim Cummins engaging literacies research project and and this the purpose of this project has been to work collaboratively with teachers students and parents to assist students in um, drawing on the full range of their cultural linguistic and representational resources in their writing and in their learning more broadly um, and part of that work has been helping the students to share this work with a wider audience and so I just want to connect to two points of that project that that um, we drew upon in conceptualizing this today. The first is the idea of collaboration. Um, this entire event couldn't have happened without a, a great deal of collaboration. And I think it also represents what happens in schools. Teachers working together with their students in collaboration to do wonderful project, <laughs> learning projects. Um, teachers working with community members, artists, um, parents to get them involved in the learning process. And I think that all of these works really stand in solidarity with that work that teachers are doing every day in their classrooms. And um, on top of that, as, as a member of that, that research project team, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with so many wonderful people, brilliant colleagues, some of whom are here today, Jacqueline, um, 
who's been a part of the team, uh, Ina, who is video recording us today, um, Tiffany, who is around as well, she's over there, and um, Sunny Lau and Mario Lopez Gopar, who have moved on to do greater, more wonderful things, um, but we remain connected. And, and part of working together with this brilliant group of people is where these great ideas have come from, and we all do far more by working together than we could ever do by ourselves. Um, the next thing I just wanted to talk about was this idea of, of sharing things with a wider audience. And um, again, with the work in the Engaging Literacies Project, we, we were invited into many teachers' classrooms where we saw excellent examples of, of practice for supporting students who are learning English at the same time as they are learning curriculum content in school. And going into these classrooms and seeing the work that teachers were doing, um, they inspired us to want to share more broadly. So as they were helping their students share work with a wider audience, we here today are helping those teachers share their work with a wider audience. And then hopefully um, <coughs> these works, which Inam is documenting, will also be included in a website that, that Jim is working on, the Language as Resource website, so it can be shared with an even wider audience. So that's how this stuff here today connects with that. Um, and just as a last comment, I wanted to share two quotes from students that um, that, that I talked to, oh, here they are. Um, who were involved in this kind of work that to me really illustrate why we do these things and, and why this is great evidence-based practice of, of things that help students learn. One student told me that when he, when he was reflecting <coughs> upon his identity text work that it made him feel smart in his brain. Mm -hmm. And um, when I walk around here today and working with everyone here today, I certainly felt smart in my brain. <laughs> as well, and I'm sure uh, all of you as educators, as researchers, whatever capacity you are connected to or interested in this work, um, maybe you feel smart in your brain too when you see this kind of stuff. Um, and then another student told me um, when she was reflecting on, on what she did that she said, that told me I can really do something to make a difference to the world. And that was pretty special. Um, I, I hesitate to claim that we are making a difference in the world, but I do know by looking at all of these projects, we are making a difference in the life, in the worlds of these these students, these children, and um, their families. And so, I think those really nicely frame why we do this work together, and, and again in solidarity with um, the students, their families, and one another as colleagues. So, thank you for being here. Um, and I'm now going to turn it over to our fabulous presenters. Uh, we have four projects. Um, the first will be shared by Susan Hind uh, from the TDSB. The next is from Nancy Dykstra from Waterloo Region, right? Uh, next is Kay Karens, Andrew Karens, and Stephanie Ledger's project. And I just it's also Waterloo, WRDSB. And then we have Lynn Schultz and her three students, Mahin Sahail, Saba Oji and Alejandra Posada, who will be sharing their work as well. And Lynn, where, where's Lynn? Waterloo. Waterloo also. All right, so I'll turn it over to Susan, and uh, Gail and I are present to help with any technological Gail. pieces. Turn the lights down. And to keep us all on time. Because we started a bit late, so. I'd just like to start by thanking Saskia for inviting me to speak today. Can you hear me? Okay, and uh, it's an honor for me to be here and to share um, my project found in, found in trans translation. So um, I'm an ESL teacher at Thorncliffe Park Public School, and Thorncliffe is a fascinating place to work. Um, we have uh, students who come from countries all over the world. Many come from Pakistan, India, Afghanistan. Um, we have some uh, smaller groups coming from Hungary, Turkey, and many more countries. 56 different languages are spoken in the school. 98% of the students speak a language other than English at home. So um, from outside, from outside uh, Thorncliffe Park School looks like any other school except for its humongous size, but it looks like any other school. And what became important to me was to, um, when you enter the school, 
was to feel that um, the unique qualities of this community would be reflected, that she would really feel, you would be able to see and hear um, where you were in, 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 in the, uh, the cultural diversity of, of this community would be evident that way. So um, what became, in, um, so uh, it became my goal to create an artwork that would reflect, um, that would reflect the languages and uh, the, sorry, I lost my place here. Uh, inc incorporate the home language writing and the images that newcomer families could relate to. In this way, the artwork could serve uh, to, to help to create an inclusive environment that would serve as a welcome to all students and their families. And here you can see how the final product, um, how the final product looks as it is installed in the front foyer of the school. Um, Um, it was a collaborative um, planning, that, and it began with um, with uh, me contacting an artist who I've worked with before at the Art Gallery of Ontario, Emilia Jimenez. We got together, and I told her how I wanted to incorporate home languages in the actual visual uh, of the of the artwork. So together, we came up with with the project. Then, um, and, oh, and Emilia works now for Inner City Angels, and so. Um, I went to Inner City Angels and uh, told them all about the project. They loved it, and they um, were able to offer us uh, funding to do the project, which we otherwise would not have been able to do. So um, I'm very grateful to um, Jane Howard Baker, the executive director there, for, for um, supporting us in that way. Um, at the school level, um, at that point, we were getting um, our, my principal involved, Kevin Vitalia who was very supportive and agreed to um, uh, to pay for a, a, a materials budget, which was not quite manageable for, for our school, um, and to uh, and approve the project, uh, because it was going to involve a lot of um, collaboration with classroom teachers, with ESL teachers, and, and families. Um, so then, um, the, way, uh, the way we decided we would do it is that we would work with Three of the newcomer uh, classes at our school. I'll talk a little bit later more about, more about the newcomer classes. Um, at the, so we have a newcomer class at the grade three, grade four, and grade five level that all of these students would work on the project. Um, and then uh, the parents were, were involved. The parents of the students who did the project were involved in, in that um, they were asked to um, assist their, support their, their children in translating text. Again, I'll talk more about that later. So um, here is my newcomer, my newcomer class, the grade three class. Um, we have Ayman and Daniel and Nabiha. Um, so a newcomer <coughs> class um, at Thorncliff, there are special classes for English language learners who are new to Canada and who speak little to no English. They're withdrawn for one quarter of the day from their regular classroom for intensive language support. They spend the rest of the day in their regular classroom. So as I said, three newcomer classes um, like this were involved. So um, before um, Amelia came, there was a lot of work that we did with the students at the school, to, um, in, with the newcomer students, to develop their ideas. And, um, <coughs> We began, we, just, we chose the theme of home because we felt that it was uh, particularly relevant uh, for these, these newcomer students and that they would potentially have quite broad ideas of what home might be, uh, which would really make their project rich. Um, so we started by having them visualize. What you're looking at here is just a chart paper where we um, jotted down some of their responses to a visualization. Um, they brainstormed words. We talked about home and what might home might look like, what it might feel like, what it might sound like, and um, had them visualize. Sometimes um, they would give um, English words, and sometimes they had to get help with peer translation, or they would draw a picture and we would give them the word. You can see that some, pe some of the responses were, some of them thought about people, like cousins and mother. Some thought about places, like buildings, city, country, world, planet. Um, and others thought of feelings like safe and peaceful and free and quiet. We were quite um, impressed with what they came up with. Um, then um, we went through the steps of developing the text from just a single word. 
and we had them use a graphic organizer. You can see the one on the left with the mother in the in the um, in the center. So this this was Nabiha's work, who you saw earlier. And who comes from? She comes from India, and she speaks Hindi. And for her, home was mother. And with prompting, she was able to add more related ideas like love or helping. And she started to put the we assisted and helped her to put those words all around on the graphic organizer. Um, so then, with teacher support, she was able to write some simple sentences, and you can see that at the top of the, the one on the right. Um, with, and then she and then she drew pic, a drew a picture to illustrate uh, her ideas, and and therefore she had and she had an opportunity to express thoughts and feelings which might have been difficult for her to express in words, but that she might have been able to show through a picture. Finally, she took the writing home. Um, we sent a letter home asking parents uh, to assist, um, their, the, assist their children with, with translating. And so uh, at the bottom, you can see, um, you can barely see, but it's there, the translation of, uh, of her text. And so you can see how ELLs begin to develop new vocabulary and language skills. So then when Amelia came, she started by having the students, um, they had a board about, like, about that big, um, and she had them paint the surface of the board uh, with all different, randomly with all different um, colors of acrylic paint. Um, so they had a lot of fun with this. You'll see this later in a, in a video I'm going to show you, with just having no sort of agenda other than covering the surface of the, of the, wooden, uh, the wooden piece with color. Then, they, um, they went, we went back to the text, and they had to come up with um, what they thought was the most, the most important um, image that, to go with the most important idea of their text. Then, we, then they created a stencil. So you can see the stencil is, is the piece in the middle on the green paper. <coughs> so, the, they would, then they, so they created the stencil, cut it out. Sometimes we, we had to assist with the cutting. And they placed the stencil on top of the colored um, surface, and then they um, they um, painted gold all, all around it, all around the uh, the edges and inside the the, uh, the stencil. And then uh, finally, um, on the very bottom right hand corner here, you can see um, how it looked when the stencil came up off the page, and that was a, a really exciting moment for the students to see um, how it all came together and how it would look. And then the last part was um, putting that key phrase, or type, you could call it a title, <clears throat> that went with the image in their home language right onto the artwork. And they did that with um, metallic pens. Oh, sorry, I'm um, So with Fariza's, uh, Fariza's artwork, which was the teddy bear. Um, what that was about was that was the teddy bear that um, she left behind um, because it wouldn't fit into her suitcase. That was the context of her story, that wouldn't fit into her, her suitcase when she left Dubai. The staircase that you see at the top right, that was Zainab and her cousin who loved to run up and down the stairs playing tag in their home in Saudi Arabia. Um, and so you can see that the pictures are both joyful and sad, and they represent the feelings of newcomer students as they adapt to their new home, which is a very important part of the settlement process. Um, and here's the, the finished work. Now, this is Nabiha's work. You can see how it all comes together. Her picture focuses in on just her and her mother, and they're connected by the flowers, and they're enclosed by the words all around them. The Hindi words mean me and my mother. And the feelings of happiness and love are expressed by the bright colors, the glowing background, and the closeness of the two figures. And finally, um, you can see Amelia at the front there kneeling down. We have all of the students just before their work was installed uh, in the front foyer holding their, holding their pieces. And you can see how proud they are. And, um, that they have been, they've been recognized as talented and capable indi individuals and they've been able to use, do the sophisticated artwork to represent their ideas. And they're feeling very proud and very excited about it. Um, I felt that the students were really changed by this experience and that they, 
they really felt closer together and had a better understanding of who each other were and also with us as their teachers. Um, so, um, and then involving them in the installation process, it provided an opportunity for the students to have ownership, not only of their artwork, but of their school. And, um, and especially the fact that it was, it's right there in the front foyer, one of the most, the most important place, probably, of the school, the entrance of the school. So finally, we had a celebration, and the vice principal came to congratulate the students for their fine work. So they were, they were highly acknowledged for their, for their work. Um, and then um, the, other, uh, the other piece to this was that uh, Inner City Angels proposed that they would like to make a documentary of this. So we're very fortunate to have um, had uh, photographers come in and document the whole process um, all, through, all through. And I'm going to show you that now. I was inspired to do this project um, by the community in which the school or the school is, um, which is Thorncliffe Park, and uh, it's a very rich um, community in the sense of uh, its diversity, both in language and in culture. Over 54 languages uh, are spoken. So what I wanted to do was to find a way to represent that diversity through art. As an ESL teacher, I'm always looking for diverse ways for students to express themselves beyond speaking and writing. And so art, for me, is a real natural uh, format for students to, to communicate. What, when I pick up that pencil and I have my paper in front of me, what would I like to draw? And just think for a little bit and do a mental, an in-your-head kind of picture. We were looking for the students to have an authentic experience working with an artist. So we work with Inner City Angels. Uh, Susan and I got together a couple of times and uh, he told me about this idea that she had to do um, a project that uh, include the, their writing and their language. The focus for the project was or is home because for these students that there's a very broad sense to that word home. They've come as I say from countries around the world and now they're here. So for them, home could be here, home could be there, home could be a variety of things. Susan developed with them a whole uh, set of questions and uh, an exercise and probably uh, integrate into her home curriculum, um, the idea of, uh, of home and what was home for them. And they wrote a little story. So they wrote the text in English and then they took, they took it home and together with their families, they translated the text. And that would be one of the ways in which um, the community would be reflected in the artwork. From their stories, then we got um, one part that was really essential to, uh, and that we could represent more graphically or visually. You just need three colors and you can make all the colors of the rainbow. Does everybody know? Red, red, okay. Yes. Thank you. 
is the essential part to the graphic of the text, to see all the diverse writings and languages that are in this And, um, and then we got the final product, that is these beautiful, colorful paintings with all these colors that they bring from home. I think that it gives them the, the confidence that they can do something that they are recognized, that is gratifying, that they can bring something that people will talk about. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of communicating. It's the power of being able to express themselves, their feelings. It is so precious for them because they are really bringing something from their, their own life. So much of the experience of a newcomer um, is to begin to find methods of communication. And verbal methods and written methods are the ones that, that we do well in school. And we need to go beyond that for all of our students, but especially for newcomer students, uh, to allow them to have a variety of ways of communicating. And art, obviously, is a beautiful connection. Um, uh, yeah, everyone can draw, and everyone can, can, can sculpt, and everyone can be involved in arts and communicate. My home is my family. My family makes me safe. They love to play with my sister. My favorite food is hot and fresh. When I eat it, I feel happy and good and safe. I love my Time, we're going to stop. So, thank you very much for. Uh, <laughs> ask more questions later about that. And I'll, Nancy, come on up. Oh, wait. Susan, that's fabulous. That video really brings it to life. I have a feeling that we're going to start seeing repeated themes. I know in mine, you're certainly going to see themes that you just saw. It's actually the one before that. Oh, that you I had hoped to start with my student's voice, but techno technology didn't let me do that. So imagine a nine-year-old boy. I chose family as my community. I chose family because it is important to me and it is my favorite community. This is the story of my family. My dad was in Canada, then he went to Romania and got my mom, and they went back to Canada in an airplane. One year later, I was born. Then three years later, my brother was born. My sister was born after another three years. I chose an airplane because my mom and dad are in the plane. I chose the house because when my mom looked out the window, she saw homes. Did you see the maple leaf in my picture? I put a maple leaf to show Canada. Canada means home to my family. This was Matthew when he was nine years old in my grade three classroom. In uh, my grade three classroom at Sand Hills Public School. It's a K to six school in the suburbs of Kitchener for, well, there's apparently a few people from Waterloo here, so many of you know that it's about 100 kilometers west of here. And it's a pretty diverse school too, I'm, I'm getting to understand. We have about 40 different languages in our school and people come from about 60 different countries, but most of our school population are not born outside of Canada. By far the majority are born in Canada, as is Matthew. So our goal, and the quilt is actually behind the screen, so you can get a glimpse of it, um, just behind the, the pictures of it there. Our goal was to use art and the experience of quilting to link a grade three social studies unit on early settler communities with the student's understanding of community, what community is and how our class is a community. And the quilt is um, a metaphor that's pretty hard to miss, I think, in terms of what community could be because it, it isn't possible to have a quilt without all the pieces working together. It isn't possible for um, any of it to function without uh, all the people doing their part to create the quilt. And so our classroom is the same, and so our communities are similar to that too. So that metaphor worked well for us. And each student made one square of the quilt as a culminating art project that had focused on um, color, design, fabric, and sewing skills. 
they also wrote a piece that we referred to as their artist statement, statement, which is what you heard me try to read in Matthew's voice, in which he identified the community and the value that it holds for him, as well as the artistic choices that uh, he had to make during the project. The unit integrated social studies, reading, writing, and media, and used technologies old and new to produce uh, different kinds of texts, a fabric text, uh, screen and audio text, which you can uh, listen to later on if you'd like. The kids have, this was all um, recorded on audio and then put on screen. And um, the printed text, the book. And I think that that's one of the strengths of this project is that it allowed and challenged the students to represent their thinking in a whole variety of ways. The inspiration from the pro for the project came from the strong quilting community that we have in Waterloo Region. In the 1800s, in the 1800s, a whole variety of groups came to settle there, but uh, a large number of them were Mennonites from the United States, and um, they are well known as quilters, uh, certainly in our area. And we used literature such as Selena and the Bear Pop Quilt, which you might be familiar with, um, Sweet Claire and the Freedom Quilt, the Rag Coat, other stories that combine identity, community, and in some cases, um, immigration or migration into the, into the stories. And Selena and the Bear Pop Quilt was actually written by a, a local author in Kitchener, so that added even more meaning for us. Planning, designing, and completing their squares gave them space to think about and tell their own stories it gave, about a community that mattered to them. And it was interesting to to just open it up and see what communities they came up with. I was wondering how much of it would be linguistic or cultural, and some certainly were, but family was an important community and also sports communities came up. So the, the sense of an identity text as um, a linguistic text um, in terms of their own language or <coughs> their, their family story came out a little bit, but I think it, identity text is a much bigger idea than that too, so it, it for us broadened that. The process also gave them repeated opportunities to talk about the topics before they wrote them down. We had quite a few volunteers that came and were involved with the project and we really encouraged the volunteers to ask questions about the stories that the children were trying to tell, about the artistic choices that they were making. And this I think was really important for um, students who are learning English but also for lots of students to have a chance to um, formulate clearly, to practice, to rehearse what they want to say before they write it down, or before they, um, they put it in their final copy. And I think that speaks to the value of finding ways for students to do this before they present. Our collaborative group included Gail, who's at the back. She and I did our mass, we met doing our masters here at Boise, in, in, well, a few years ago, a few years ago now. and. Um, she was working at that time as a researcher here and was involved with doing other research with my class and it kind of snowballed into this project. We were able to hire two local artists, Pat and Judy, through funding from an organization called Art Smarts. And every one of us brought different skills to the table. Judy and Pat taught different <coughs> sections of the process. They were often there at the same time, but not all the time. Judy is a local fabric artist. She's a, a phenomenal quilter. And um, she came and spoke to the children about her process as an artist and um, helped them making their artistic decisions. She brought a lot of her work with her and she is a quilter, but not in the sort of typical or traditional sense. So her, her quilts are, are fabric pictures and that was a beautiful fit with what we were trying to do with our students and ha having them tell their stories through fabric pictures. And, um, oh, I think I missed about Pat. Where are we now? There's Pat. There she is. She is uh, an accomplished quilter in her own right, and she was also an art consultant before she retired, so we had, um, we, we scored doubly with Pat. She's, she was a fabulous teacher and um, had really good sense about what visual arts could be in the classroom, and became the lead teacher for teaching the smaller projects on route, on route to the big one. So we had, um, you can see the small square there at the bottom here. This was the, this was their beginning 
quilt experience, looking at color and figuring out how to use a needle and thread, and then the Valentine's mats were teaching them a little bit more about design and moving all of this, moving towards the bigger piece. So they kept the small ones in. Um, the big one took on a story of its own. Both Judy and Pat are members, as I said, they're both um, quilters and they're members of a local quilting community which gave them um, and us access to more volunteers and, um, and materials that we wouldn't have been able to get on our own. I would never try this on my own, but <laughs> it's really worth it to, to collaborate and dream bigger and then find the support to make that happen. I, I, it developed a momentum all on its own and um, when it's planned collaboratively with, collaboratively with the children, they own it and they really work hard at it. Um, and it helps when the success of the project depends on everybody doing their part. Keeping the class on track and engaged was a non-issue because, because of that ownership, I think. You've probably felt the same thing when you've done projects like that. Um, they did it because they, uh, they, they uh, got so much out of it, they owned it. Originally, we were going to donate the quilt to Mennonite Central Committee, which provides um, app, um, cover, quilting kind of, kind of covers for people in different parts of the world, and we thought this would be a great thing to donate to that project. But Judy um, said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to donate the quilt to MCC through the local uh, quilting auction that happens every year. In, at the end of May, there's a huge auction that happens in New Hamburg. And um, she said, that's where this is going. We're going to commit to putting it into a public auction. So that really ramped up the requirement for quality. <laughs> <laughs> the kids were working with real artists on their own stories for a real audience. And they had to produce something that could stand on its own, that could stand the test of time, that could explain itself. Because for all we knew, strangers were going to buy this quilt and hang it up somewhere. And other strangers were going to see it. So kids never said, are we done yet, or I'm bored, or I don't want to write today, none of that. And as time went on, the quilt started taking uh, shape, and pressure started to mount that this quilt actually belonged in our school, and not out there somewhere where there was a school. So I was feeling pretty conflicted by that point, because even Judy, the artist, was saying, you should have this quilt in your school, the one who told us to sell it. But the secretaries were saying, uh, we want this quilt hanging in the office. And I was thinking, uh, we're trying to sell. This is going to cost money. So um, I was convinced to go to school council and ask them to donate $500 towards this project because Judy thought that it might go for as much as $500 at the auction. And you know, when you make those kind of suggestions, guess who gets the job? So I had to go, I don't know about you, but auctions. Like my heart, just looking at that picture, my heart rate goes up like jump. And uh, it was very exciting. I had never been to the auction itself. There's a lot of food outside the arena, and that's where I usually go. But I had to go um, and become part of the auction. And uh, it was a very exciting day. The students were thrilled just at the prospect of being in the auction. They were famous. They said, we're famous. I can see them today. We're famous, jumping around the room because they were featured in the auction, in the, in the um, brochure that you can see on the table there. So there was, um, there's just no doubt in my mind about, about the value of authenticity, about authentic, working with authentic authors, working on your own story, working for an authentic audience. It's, it was, was quite phenomenal. I did get to buy it back. There were other bidders even, and it was a bit of back and forth, and, we had to. We went over the price, and it was all very exciting day. <laughs> but now it's back, and the stool, the students certainly know how it contributes to our school. It hangs in the office. The secretaries get to see it every day, and um, I asked them. And I'd like to just end with this part. I I asked uh, them today, two years later. Whoops! How do they feel about their quilt when they look at it in the office and? Uh, they say things like, I remember how hard we worked and how fun it was. I'm really proud to see it hanging up there in the office. The quilt in the office reminds me of the stories and of my friends in that class. I remember learning to do something I never thought I could do. And Matthew, who is now bigger than me in just about every way, I asked him out on the playground, what do you, what do you think of when you think of that quilt project? And he said, 
oh, that little one, I keep that in my treasure box. Mm. So that's our, that's our book story. and I'm here to tell you a little bit about the dual language book writing club that we started at our school in 2004. With me is Andrew, he's my son, and he's been helping us almost from the beginning. Uh, the person that's not with me is Stephanie Ledger, she's presenting at another workshop today. But um, we've worked a lot together over the years and our project started just basically as a very small idea, I guess, that has grown. And we just decided we wanted to give children at our school an opportunity to be able to write in uh, English in their first language. So my school is a K-6 school. 45% um, of the students um, speak a language other than English at home. And um, we're fairly close to the university, so a lot of our, our students ha are quite literate in their first language. And their parents uh, want them to continue to uh, develop in their first language. So um, we thought uh, writing books with them would be a good idea and um, you know, give them a way to just express themselves. And as I said, it started as a very small idea, it's kind of grow, grown and evolved over the years. And um, when I look at some of the early books we did, I think, oh yeah, we've learned so much since then about how to do this and, and what the kids uh, want. So um, what we did was basically just to pair uh, students at our school that speak the same first language and have some degree of uh, literacy, first language literacy, together and invite them to just write a book. We tried to encourage them to do um, a, st a book that would tell their story about coming to Canada, but they basically just did their own idea, or they did what they wanted to do, and we let them do that because we really believed that it was important for them to have their voice and uh, whatever stage they were at at that point, they just told their story the way they were going to tell it. So we, we keep our hands off quite a bit. We don't, you know, we don't change a whole lot of things as long as it's grammatically correct in, in English and you know, we may have a better way to say it, but that's okay. They are where they are, and they're going to say what they want to say, and we've basically just left things that way. Um, in 2008, we had a chance to uh, do the project uh, as a two-week uh, workshop, if you will, in the summer at the public library, and we, we received funding from Citizenship and Immigration, the uh, Settlement Workers Partnership Program, um, to do that at the library. And uh, we really enjoyed that because having the two weeks, rather than just at school, taking them for one or two uh, nutrition breaks in a week and having them write over several months, this was something that was going to be done in two weeks. And um, it gave us a chance to do sort of mini lessons with them and teach them just different things about what they were doing with their writing. And um, from that, we were able to put copies of the children's books into the public library, the Waterloo Public Library. And, um, and since then we've received more funding, so now the children's books that we have are in Kitchener Public Library and Cambridge uh, Library, as well as our school library as well. And um, the kids are proud, I'm, I'm hearing that from other people, the kids are just so proud of what they can do. And from the beginning, it, for Stephanie and I, and for Andrew, it's been more about uh, the process of their writing. Sure, we get a book at the end, and it's a book that other teachers can use and other students can read. Um, but when they're with somebody else and they're discussing what they're going to write and using their first language, and the surprise on their face when I, you know, I say, yes, just speak to your, your partner in, in your language and say what you need to say and go home and discuss it with your parents and, and that sort of thing, it just really makes them feel that they're important and um, what they have to say is worthwhile. And um, anyway, over the years, there were a lot of people saying to us, uh, you know, how did you start this? What did you do? And um, so we got government funding to do a webcast and website 
going to show you some of that today. And, um, and it's just kind of gone on from there. So to date, we have about uh, 20 different languages uh, in our books that we have uh, that are represented. And um, there's more on the go. Like I have more children that are writing this year. And um, some people have asked about the books. And we, we get them bound because initially we just did them on shortboard. And they were just, when we started the project, as I said, it was just supposed to be a small little project we were going to do. And it was, we were going to have these books in, the, in our library at the school. And somebody said, well, if you're going to put them in the library, they're going to get worn out. And we just thought, well, we would, we would then have them bound. And, um, and that's what you will see today at the back. Um, Steph and I really think it's important because she's the ESL teacher, I'm the classroom teacher, that, you know, as we work together, all the children that are in our school um, are ours, both of ours. Not, you know, I'm not sending my children off to her room to, you know, have their hour or whatever ESL. We're doing things together, we're supporting them together, and we want them to know that they count, that they have a voice, and that what they do matters. And that's, that's basically what the project is about. So I know we're short on time. I don't want to say any more because I'm going to show you a clip um, uh, from the webcast um, that talks about who benefits because of the project that we've, that we've done. And um, I have handouts at the back that have our website um, address. And it's got the webcast on it so that you can get in, in there and see the different um, say chapters of, of the webcast that talk a little bit differently about each part of the project that we do and you can do that on your own time. So. So Jane, just um, should I stand there? All the titles here are on the webcast as separate titles. I'm just playing it from the DVD because it's uh, higher quality. Obviously, we don't want you sitting there forever, so the webcast is sort of streaming quality. The Fifth Club gives students an opportunity to use and improve their first and second language skills. Research shows that students who continue to maintain their first language literacy learn English more quickly and fluently. Children that continue their, their literacy in their first language do make all sorts of connections. It's really like a bridge from what they know already in their first language to their new language. The children see that they're not, they're not uh, replacing one language with another, that really they're adding to their language base. I think is a really important thing. Students are enthusiastic about making connections between their first language and English. When they discuss their story using both of their languages, there is a freer exchange of ideas. When students are involved in a multi-step book writing process, they can develop their language skills on many levels. They use oral and written language skills and have the opportunity to develop these skills through discussion, problem solving, and sharing ideas with their partner. The club fosters a strong sense of pride and personal identity. I think they're very proud that they are able to do this. I think a lot of the children who come from other countries um, are viewed by other students in the school as being uh, of, as needing help and as, as not as um, proficient in, in uh, that school as, as they are. And then when the other students see that they actually do have a lot of ideas and that really it's just basically a language barrier that is preventing them from showing what they can do, they, they really want to belong to the club too. I'm very proud that my books, gonna, our books are going to be in the library. So whenever I look at it, I'm so proud. We value the support of family members. They offer their first language expertise and help their children to make connections to their culture. And Sheree, why don't you try writing a word at a time like you do in English? And then and then I'll take a look at the spelling. I enjoy working with Sharif because uh, 
we uh, seemed like he forgot lots of stuff about his country. And uh, I had to come here and remind him and to show him how my language, how he can write it, and to give him more memories about how he used to be young. Are you writing in German right now? Yeah. And does it feel exciting to be able to write the language that you speak with your dad? It's quite difficult. Family members also benefit because they are involved in a school activity and have the opportunity to further develop their English skills. Parents' involvement in the book club also helps them to make connections with settlement workers, other parents, and community resources. There are many benefits to our school community. The dual language books are shared with students in classrooms and the school library. They can also be used as a teaching resource and provide opportunities for class discussion. Dot, which Ruby Devlin's character shape. Now, I wanted to tell you all that there are more books like this in our own library here at Winston Churchill School. And you guys can take them out because, as I said before, they are in English and in other languages. We're in the library in our school, and these are our dual language books. Um, some are books that have been made by publishers, and others are books that our students have made in our dual language book club. And it's very exciting for students to come to our school as a newcomer to Canada, and to be able to come to the library and sign out books that are in their first language, as well as English, and they can uh, eventually learn to read the English a little bit better. Uh, but it's, it's comforting to see something familiar when you're new to the country. The club also provides opportunities for leadership. Club members from past years return to mentor our current student authors. Our community has also benefited from the donation of our books to the public library. It's nice seeing literacy actually in action uh, and <coughs> sort of having your in a way your own self-produced books it's, it's very wonderful that we've had a hand in this even if a small hand in this it's just great our student authors have also shared their stories at a city council meeting and a local multicultural fair the boys there from Congo. Um, normally when we do the, the books, we pick students that um, can write a little bit in their own language, but the younger boy there was pestering us for a couple of years and we finally said, okay, you know, we'll do that. And so I, I just wanted to, to mention that it was such a good thing for them and for the older brothers as well as the younger brother and um, just to, to have memories and, and make those kind of connections. And our club is, is evolving, like we're, we're trying new things and doing new things all the time and it's basically just about the kids. Okay, so speaking of students, we'll have the, our documentarian and authors coming up with Lynn um, who are going to share their work. And then I think what we'll do um, after that is Jim can say a, a couple sentences or two, and then we will um, <laughs> we will have the questions where you can just go in and, and speak with everybody. So themselves. I think we can turn the lights back on, maybe Tiffany, if that's okay. They're not going to do a power. 
So good morning. Um, I thought the best way to demonstrate student voice was to bring some students. So we had a little sleepover. And they came from Kitchener waking up at 5 in the morning. So they're committed. <laughs> um, so this is Mahin and Alejandra and Saba. And I'm going to talk about a lot of projects, but not in too much detail, but enough detail that you could do them uh, yourselves. And then they're going to highlight a few <laughs> they're going to highlight some of the things about the specific ones they were in. So, um, <clears throat> just my own background, my name is Lynn Schultz. I grew up in Toronto at Bay of Bloor. And I think that I grew up in this multicultural apartment building. It was a student visa apartment building of U of T. So I think that influenced my future a little bit. And I also have an um, outdoor and experiential um, education background in phys ed. And it, as I'm listening to everything, it dawns on me that that's what this is all about. <clears throat> so that makes me a bit of an intuitive teacher. Um, I don't know how to spell curriculum. <laughs> and um, what I've heard today, I, I'll confess to you that I never knew the term identity text. But then Sharon from our board said, could you come and present? And we realized we're doing this stuff a lot. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is that we listen to these guys. During their classes, they talk, they air concerns, they talk about sometimes complaints about teachers, and, they le and that leads to fantastic projects. And what I heard from the three presentations before, the words that keep coming up are partnerships, collaboration, authenticity, engagement, validation, pride, showcasing, showcasing strengths instead of weaknesses. That's really key um, for our newcomers. And then um, overall school climate building. So we've been part of a bit of, there's been a little bit of a <clears throat> immigrant spring at our school, I guess, a revolution since 2009. So it all started with, um, a video from a, um, that was made in, in a, uh, as a media project, a grade 11 media student, a Canadian kid, who um, interviewed or asked permission, got all, made, made some connections with newcomers, realized she had never really met these people too much, and she made a connection in the community and then decided, our school needs to meet these people, we need to do a video. So um, I also should mention that everything we have today is available, that you, could, uh, you can put a name on a list for Steph's video, which was a couple of years ago, Mahin's video, and she'll tell you about it. We're going to get them public, um, printed nicely and we can mail them to you. Not that you would use ours, but that you could do your own at your school. Um, and then a, a book is available for sale, blah, blah. Anyway, I'll come to that in a minute. Anyway, so um, Steph had um, interviewed a bunch of immigrant youth, like newcomers, and, uh, immigrants and refugees at our school, and we were able to show it to the whole school. And there's that whole sense of after we showed it, they were just telling their story, what it's like, and other kids... It, it, it had a ripple effect right away and kids started walking taller and it led us to continue these things. So just to list the things we've been into, it was Steph's video and we actually presented that at OIZ two years ago, I think. Then we did a project called Newcomer Drama where we had a professional um, multicultural theater troupe train our kids, 12 newcomers to show um, a piece to students and to board members and that was funded by Citizenship Immigration or CIC. Then um, two projects, that, one of the two projects we will highlight more and that's posted over there um, with the, the photos and the, the words. That was part of a thing called Youth for Health. I'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, and then another project which I'm only representing because the, uh, Monica Petras from Forest Heights was the lead on this and Sharon Newmaster who's presenting elsewhere. But two of the authors are here today. That would be Mahin and Saba. And um, this is another project that was done in conjunction with Deborah Ellis. That's more explained at the back there. And this is available for $10, no profit. Donations, go, or the pro money goes to help other pro projects like it. And then that led to a video called The Second Student, which is the other one we're going to highlight in a little more detail. Um, and uh, a multicultural show that we do that has the theme of all that we are talking about here. And then, um, I guess my whole point is that we, all of this leads to a whole ripple effect that has a great um, energy in the school, which leads to climate improvement and equity and inclusion and all that stuff. And so we've seen the results of that where some students who, um, even this year, refugee kids who, before they did some of these authentic experience, I think we call them identity texts, um, they are presenting in mainstream classrooms um, little slide presentations about their lives um, in conjunction with grade 9 English um, 
novels or things like that, and it's it's amazing. It's blowing people away, and it makes connections, and it makes them feel great. So, project number one. Um, after we listened a lot to students talking, and after Steph's video, um, Mahin was asked to do a video, and I'm going to let you talk her talk about that right now. So. Hi, my name is Mahin. Um, I came to Canada about two and a half years ago, and I think it was my first year here in grade 11 when I saw Steph's video, and it basically highlighted all the different ESL and ELL kids. But the one thing that was missing in that video was why do that kids feel that way? So the video talked about how the kids felt really lonely and sad and all that. But what wasn't exactly addressed was that how can we fix this? So then, um, in my grade 12 year, which was last year, Ms. Scholes came up with the idea that... And Ms. Hornick, and Ms. Hornick, and Ms. Hornick, the head of the ESL department, uh, ELL department, came up with the idea that maybe it's the teachers who need to learn more about what these students go through in class, and maybe the teachers are ignoring what's actually happening. So we came up with this idea of interviewing the ESL and ELL kids and um, making up a documentary for the board and for the, especially for the teachers of our school to show it to them so that the issues can be addressed. So it was more of an evaluation of the teachers by the students. So we did that in the documentary and it's available so you can sign up and it's 15 minutes long. And it basically goes through the four stages of um, acculturation, acculturation. Um, and it basically talks about what the kids think that the teachers are doing or are not doing or what should work, such as they should talk slowly, give handouts, um, maybe like pay attention to them, boost their confidence, stuff like that. So um, Saba uh, was involved in that video as well and yeah, we showed it. At one, one other thing that her, the video highlighted, I don't know if you remember this part, but um, the, uh, Mahin also was t helping to clarify, to, we're high school, right? So helping to clarify with the mainstream teachers, what is ELD? And, what, and by, by showing real ELD kids explaining who they are yeah. and what is ESL with real ESL kids sh showing who they are and where they come from. And then you were going to say about Saba was in, interviewed. So, And, and the, like the last portion that Saba was part of was an interview where she got to actually talk to her teachers and it was shown at a, at a staff meeting. We, uh, we, yeah, we did show it at a staff meeting and um, the teachers were actually quite interested in it. A lot of questions came up and they asked us a lot of questions about how can they actually fix it and um, I, it, I think it did have a good effect on the teachers and they actually asked for the DVDs and played it in their classrooms for the other students to get to learn from it as well. And Saba was in it and I think she sure. can tell you a bit about how she actually felt and you were actually an inspiration for making it because Simon would come and say, you know, we're working so hard and the teachers don't quite get where we're coming from. So how did it feel, the interview, and what do you think it accomplished? Well, for me, it's always like, always felt like, I don't, most of the immigrant kids, I feel like they're, since they don't have the English, they can't get the mark for it. So for me, saying it to, like, in front of the camera and knowing that teachers will hear it, that make me a Lot, like it made me feel better because I knew that they they would change something about like their way of teaching or something, and it was a good it was a good experience. Yeah. Did you get any response from your teachers? Did anyone comment after the staff meeting? They told me I saw you in the video. <laughs> <laughs> so. And also to make it so it wasn't personal, there was. We collected a lot of um, feedback from students and then got one person who wasn't those people to narrate what they would like their teachers to do more of. And I, I think it's not that the teachers don't want to help, the mainstream teachers, I think they're overwhelmed um, and sometimes just don't know how. And that came out when we showed them the video. They actually said, we know that we know that this is hard and we're trying to struggle with it and we want to help these kids, it's just that we don't know how. So that's something that came up in that meeting. And yeah. we'll and just um, for those of you not from Waterloo, um, we don't have the same demographic as you, the high intense, uh, like the density of immigrants, but we are, I don't know, it used to be the fifth largest immigrant reception area, I don't know if it still is, but it's a pretty multicultural community and growing. So that's why there's a lot going on there, I suppose. So we're good with that? Yeah. Okay. So, and like we said, we can you can sign up for one, we can send them for free when we get them printed properly. Um, the other project that was kind of exciting, and this also was a partnership. Um, in Waterloo Region, we have settlement workers. Do you have settlement workers? In, is that Ontario-wide, I guess? So um, we had a partnership, actually, with U of T, the Dalla Lena School of Public Health Policy, 
um, came to our settlement worker and proposed a project called Youth for Health. Now I know if we did a mental health por portion and some people in Toronto did a nutrition portion. Anyway, it was an amazing thing. Um, it was a, unfortunately the funding got cut, but we're going to show you how you can keep something like it going with no money. So um, they came, they asked for our help actually, and it was a project to um, teach kids about health, to become a health, a youth health navigator, which was to help understand the healthcare system and help um, their families be able to handle it better. It also coached them with peer support um, and understanding even the language of mental health, il mental illness and mental health strategies, peer support and um, that, that whole area. So the, pro the part of the project that we featured over there, also the kids got an honorarium, which is out of, out of control. So we, they got 150 bucks if they did this thing for how long? Six weeks, eight weeks? No, like more, 12 months. weeks? Anyway, but the part we featured <laughs> over there is something that anybody in any classroom could do. And this task, and I'm gonna ask two of the kids to read it, something for you, but this task was they were asked to go around the school. They, and U of T was amazing. They brought cameras, all the paraphernalia and um, go around the school and just take a photo of something that indicates something about mental health around the school. So it's a photo essay. So you have your photo and then you write the words. And these don't necessarily belong to these people. These, they weren't, you guys weren't the authors of these, but if you could read them. Okay, so in this one, as you can see in the picture, the right there wrote, here I see a bright red uh, exit sign on the wall. The exit sign is always shining for an emergency situation. We sometimes suffer a hard time in our life lives and think that there is no way out of this but we have to realize that there is always a way out of the situation also the exit sign uh, is near around us so we don't have to feel worried this strength exists because we suffer some uh, something as we live and we need to we need something that could help to stay strong mentally by looking at this uh, picture we can obtain strength of, uh, of a positive uh, mind even though you are in a bad or hard situation that you can't handle well. First, we must not feel frustrated or embarrassed too much. You can't go back uh, to the past because you don't have a time machine. Just go through the experience uh, and experience it. It will give a great life lesson. There's a way out. You will be, you will be fine. Okay, one more, just one more. There's a short one here. So in this picture, I see a dark library with nobody in there. Every, everybody left. This relates to our lives because sometimes you will feel like everybody left you and you feel depressed. This problem exists because if you failed at something and sometimes you will feel empty. We need to deal with these feelings because it is going to happen. Practice, practice and make it happen less. Thank you. So this was a, this was um, specially offered to newcomer students, and like I said, the funding was um, cut. But the, but because of the the impact of the program, the kids said we got to try to keep this going in some way, in some way. So and Mahin was in that program also. Can you talk a little bit about what's what's brewing right now? And I guess the the, the exciting thing about this is that every one of of these projects probably gets momentum going for other things it's, and, and that's what we're finding in the 2009 video it all fits together and so what's happening and you guys have all seen this because you're participating and actually two out of three of them are graduating but they still want to help this new thing happen so so what happened to this was thanks to Youth for Health um, I was able to get onto the student council and I uh, became the health and well-being coordinator of the school so then we went, we did a mental health week at our school, and then um, a lot of us kids went to a mental health week in... Um, or day. Day, 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 youth talk, day. right? Youth talk. Um, and over there, we all sat in a circle, and this was kids from all different kinds of places from our school. So ESL kids, and Wave. the mainstream kids, WAVE, GSA, and I think all, were you there? Yes. Yeah. yeah, all three of us were there, and we sat in a circle, and we talked about what comes out of this whole mental health awareness week. And we realized that something is missing in our school, and what's missing in our school is the connection between all these things that we have, and, and the connection between what are we going to do with kids who actually need the help. And we need equity and we need inclusion. We have all these little things happening, but we don't actually have a major thing that supports all of these things and connects them. 
So we went back to the school. Um, our principal and our teachers, they were starting a new thing as well. Equity and inclusion and symposium. Yeah. So we all knew that this, there was this hole within our school that we need to fill. So we had a symposium where all different kinds of kids came and we talked about how can we fill this gap of the equity and inclusion and how can we make it better. We're running out of time, so I'm going to, can you, ex Alejandra, can you explain the new group that, that came out of this? Okay, so um, we made this group and it's practically uh, kids from every group of the school, like WAVE and ESL and uh, the ABCD groups, everybody. And we decided that we wanted to do this type of a mother group that reuni reunites all the groups together and that we can make some of the kids from our schools, how do you call it, um, peer mentors, Marginal, yeah, oh yeah, peer, peer mentors, mentors that everybody would come to them if they need help and they would be available uh, the whole day if they need it. So we're in that, so like, discussing kids, that. Yeah, and it's, it's instead of kids happen. going to like their guidance counselor because kids feel sometimes shy, they're going to have trained students who they can talk to more easily. So Sam, a last comment. When you're involved in all of these kinds of things, what, or what do you think about these programs? How does it affect you or the others who get involved in them? I felt like my voice could be heard, and I felt like I was part of something bigger than like the school stuff, the school grouping or anything. And for me, or for I think the others, it was the best experience that we got from the school. Yeah. And I think what, what we've seen, I, and I have the privilege of having a student teacher here, and she's seen the kids who have been involved in such projects and those who haven't, and they, sort, they, they have all even reported themselves anecdotally that they never would have tried out for student council if. I couldn't have done that presentation if I hadn't. So they, it really does have an impact, as, as you all know. I mean, if you're here, we kind of know that stuff. Anyway, just as a summary, the book you can purchase for ten dollars if you want at the back and two of them can talk about that project and all three of them can talk about there's three videos happening and a photo essay project so thank you and then do you want to lead us into the gallery walk sure okay <laughs> um, let me just thank all the uh, presenters uh, that was truly awesome it speaks for itself. I don't need to add anything. And uh, just uh, thank you all again. And, and also those of, those of you who haven't had the opportunity to present orally in front here, we can see what's uh, what you've been doing, which is obviously similar uh, and uh, equally powerful. So I think what we've just experienced is a glimpse or multiple glimpses of what education can be. So thank you all. Uh, definite, we have this space until 3.15. Uh, I invite you to stay as long as you can for all of the exhibitors, um, but definitely until 12.15 um, or so, and uh, enjoy. Thank you. We also have feedback forms up here. Please, we want to know what you think of, of this, so please fill that out if you can. Great. Thank you, Enam. How does that